the Lamb of God raised up before the world for the sins of the whole world and as a propitiation that he died so that through him men might be saved. What a wonderful, wondrous thing. That the Son of God became a Son of Man so that we sons of men might become the children and the sons of God. And Lord, the price that Christ paid to make us what we are is a price that goes on through all ages. And the value and the reward of that price reaches to the innermost part of the world. We are grateful because that price of redemption has reached us, transformed us, and you want it to reach beyond transformation. You want to bring us to a place where that same little child Jesus will be truly Lord in our lives. And so that he can reach out through us and bring others to meet with the Lamb and thereafter to accept him as Lord. This I pray. You will do all you purpose in your mind in the life of every worshiper today in Jesus' name. We ask that you meet with us so that as we sit or stand or whatever posture we adopt, you will speak to us there where we are. Remove everything, barriers, that will hinder your word from finding fertile ground in our hearts in Jesus' name. We thank you for the answer. In Jesus' name. We pray. For message this morning, we're looking from, checking up from John chapter 1. And we have the topic, Jesus, and you put a colon, Lamb and Lord. Jesus, Lamb, and Lord. In John 1 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him. And he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That was John at the commencement of his ministry, verse 35. Now, please, I will not want movement when the word of God is good, except the ushers. And uh, ushers, your movement should be discreet, too. Uh, let's be, please, uh, let's respect the word of God. In John 1.35, and again, the next day after, John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Well, let me just say here that what happened in verse 29 was a public thing. What happened in verse 35 and verse 36 was a private thing. But you will notice that whether in public, with the multitudes and the crowds, or in the private, with just two disciples in attendance, the message of John the Baptist never changed. The same message. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. How many preachers that when they are in private, they can lay it on the line and tell people maybe one to one, a one on one, and say, this is what the Bible says. When they get to the open, maybe in the SHSF or something or wherever, or wherever God gives them pulpit, then because they see the face, or the faces, they feel that if I say it the way I said it to that person when we were one on one, uh, it may be another thing. But John will not do like that. What he said in the private, he said in the public. What he said to the crowd outside, he said to these disciples who are not even sinners already, they were his disciples. That tells you faithfulness in ministry. Now, but that's because. The ministry of John the Baptist had been prophesied before he was born. Among other things, we are told in Luke chapter 1, verses 16 
uh, and 17. And when the angel was giving prophecy of the birth of John to his father, Zechariah, uh, he told Zechariah in verse 14, he said, well, you're going to have a child, and that child is going to be a special child. And he said, you'll call his name John. And then he told that man, he said, you're going to have joy and gladness. He said, many are going to rejoice as if, at his birth. Then after he, after he said that, he said that child will be great in the sight of the Lord. Then in verse 16, he says that child will have a ministry. An unusual ministry, a ministry that was both relevant and necessary for his own age. He said that child will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. That means they are turned away from God. He was to turn them back to God. And then he said that's not all. But in verse 16, 17, he said, He, that same John, that's your child, will go before him. That means before the Lord. The Lord in verse uh, 16. He will go before that same Lord in the spirit and the power of Elias, Elijah. And he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And he's going to turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. And he's going to make ready a people prepared for the Lord threefold assignment. He was going to turn the hearts of the fathers, in fact four. He was going to turn the hearts of the men back to the Lord their God. They are turned away from God. His work was to turn them back to God now. Not only that, he's going to turn the fathers to their children. There was family disharmony, family disunity, disintegration of uh, family values. And he says he's going to turn them back one to another. There will be a lateral kind of turning to one another a horizontal kind of turning, father to child, here on earth. But he said that will not be all. If the father turns to the child, child turns to father, that will just be physical, earthly, normal. But he said there is something more than that. He will also turn the disobedient, the rebellious, the wicked, the sinful, the naughty, those who are not who didn't know God, he will turn them to the disobe to the uh, wisdom of the judge. That means they will turn from disobedience to just being just. That means righteous. That means it will turn them to God. Not just turn them to one another. It will turn them to God. Then he summarizes everything in verse 17, the last part. He says, the summary of everything this man is going to do is to make ready a people. Prepare not for himself, but for the Lord. And this is the goal of every God-ordained ministry. To turn people, make ready a people for the Lord. Now then, the, John, the ministry of John and the goal of his ministry, having been predetermined before his birth, when now he was born, he set about that ministry in a manner that is most instructive to us today. Remember, he was going to turn the people to the Lord, to accept the Lordship of Christ. But he didn't start with that. He started with making them to behold the lamb because John knew if they didn't behold the lamb if the lamb did not wash them if the lamb did not cleanse them they could never accept him as Lord and you see the style of his ministry in chapter 1 that we read he found there's a John chapter 1 you found him there pointing the people he said I didn't know him but the one that sent me told me that anyone I see and I see a dove descending upon him that's the lamb of God that's the Lamb of God. Now the ultimate was to make the people to accept Christ as Lord. But John didn't start from there. He knew that you couldn't accept Christ as Lord in your life if you have not accepted him as Lamb of God for you. So in chapter 1, he spoke about the Lamb of God. In chapter 3, he talks about the Lord of glory. Now in chapter 3 of John, uh, just uh, in, verse, in verse 26. John 3, 26. And as they come again to John, and they said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. That's talking about Jesus. Then John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ. I'm not the Savior, I'm not the Messiah, but that I am sent before him. He that has a bride is the bridegroom, but the friend 
of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Then that epic statement. Verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. That's the lordship. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is heartly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven, talking about Jesus Christ, is above all, he is Lord. That's the peak, the apex, the topmost portion of the ministry of John the Baptist. And he said, I will continue to decrease until I fade into insignificance, and he will continue to increase until he is preeminent and he feels everywhere. That I will continue to diminish. My own light will continue to dim. His own light will continue to get brighter until my own light is no longer seen. And his own light is the only thing that is seen all over the world. He becomes Lord over all and in all and through all and in every one of us all. He says that's the Lordship of Christ. He says, but until then, I will start at the proper place to start. First, the Lamb of God. Then, the Lord of glory. What an instruction once again to those of us who are Christian workers. That the problem, the bane of Christianity today, the problem of Christianity today is a lamb doctrine without a Lord doctrine. That Christ is lamb, he saves, but he is not the Lord who controls and has dominion over the life. And so you find a generation of people that have the lamb ministry of Christ, washing them from sin, and nothing more besides. He is not the Lord. And that's not the thing. And so you find that John the Baptist realized that it's not possible, and it's vain, for us to attempt to try to press the Lordship of Christ on souls that have not known the lamb ministry of Christ. That it's a futile thing. It is a useless exercise. Trying to get people to accept the Lordship of Christ when they have not accepted Him as Lamb. And He knows also that it's not good for us to press the Lamb ministry of Jesus Christ on people and stop there without pressing further. The Christian, many people today, that's all they want. Tell me about the Lamb of God. Tell me about the one that washes uh, whiter than snow. Tell me about the one that cleans. Tell me about the one that is Lord, uh, that is a, a Savior. But the Lordship of Christ. And even all the people all over the place that say, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. Ask them, what do you understand by Jesus being Lord? Is he Lord over your life? You will find that they only have it as a slogan. They don't know what it means. And so John the Baptist said the two must go together and that's the uniform testimony of jesus of the bible the lamb and the lord christ will not be lamb full stop and he doesn't want to be lord without being lamb in your own life he must be the lamb and the lord can you follow me please to acts chapter 2 and you'll see some scriptures where both are put together lamb and lord in john acts rather acts chapter 2 verse 36 Therefore, this Peter preaching, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom you have crucified. That's his lamb ministry. Please, I'm going to use a word today that I'm not sure is correct, but for my purpose, so to make it easy, I will say that's his lamb sheep. And now, he says, he says the same Jesus, he was crucified. That's his lamb sheep. He's being killed as the Lamb of God for the sacrifice of the sin of the world. And then, that same Christ whom you have crucified, who is the Lamb, God has made him both, what? Lord and Christ. What that, mean, that means then is that in that passage we see that it's both Lamb and Lord together. In, Acts, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you this testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's His lamb sheep. That's His lamb sheep. Jesus crucified. But Paul says, I won't stop there. It's an incomplete gospel for us to talk about His lamb sheep without His lordship. 
It's an incomplete Christian life for him to be the lamb that washes from sin, but not the Lord that controls and has dominion over the life. And so Paul said, I will not know anything among you except Jesus and him crucified. His lamb sheep, the lamb of God. Then in verse 6, then he says, um, How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect? And uh, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none, none of the princes of this world knew. Now listen to this. For had they known need, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. In the same breath that he spoke about Jesus as the Lamb crucified, in that same breath, he talks about Christ being the Lord of glory. You see the combination. You see the two together. How you begin to check up in your life? Is Christ the Lamb? Has he even been the Lamb at all? And not only that, if he has been the Lamb, he has cleansed you. Is he the Lord? Is his Lordship established firmly and realistically in your life? Now, in Second, second, uh, second Corinthians chapter 11 sorry 1st Corinthians 11 verse 23 1st Corinthians 11 23 for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you that the Lord listen to that Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed Lord Jesus that's his lordship Betrayal and crucifixion and death. That is lamb sheep. In Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 verse 8. Now he's been speaking from verse 5 about, you know, let this mind be in you, uh, about Christ and so on. He made himself of no reputation. In verse 8 now. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross is lamb sheep. He was killed. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow his lordship. And of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Don't you see there that both the lampship and the lordship, they go together. And if you can't, say, you can't separate them one from the other, it means that in your life, if Christ is lamb, but it's not law, you are not a legal tender. You look at the coins, there are two faces. You look at the currency notes, there are two faces. For that currency note to be a legal tender, the two faces must be there. What do you think about a currency note that was printed? And due to, well, some error of printing, the front page is there. And the picture of the you know, man or woman that he wanted to put on it is there. The flip side is just blank. And if you take that to the market and you say, I want to buy this, here is money. I'm not going to tell you that what kind of money is this. This is not acceptable. It's not legal tender. Because the two sides are not there. And if in your own life, the two sides are not there on the day of judgment. When we get over there, he is lamb. But it's not Lord. God will tell you you are not a legal tender. That's why it's important you check up in your life. Is he both lamb and Lord? Or is he lamb without being Lord? Usually that's the most thing that the, what happens the most of the times. You don't find him being Lord without being lamb after all. You don't get to reverse if you have not gone to primary school. So he doesn't become your Lord if he has not been your lamb first of all. But most of the time, many people stop at just lamb of God. And that's all. And nothing more besides. But that will not be acceptable on the day of judgment. Now, in point one, because of time, I'm looking at, behold, the Lamb of God. Two, behold, his life of grace. Point three, bow down before the Lord of glory. Behold, Lamb of God. And as you behold him, his ministry, then you have to go further. Behold his life. His life of grace, full of grace. Because the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth was given by Jesus Christ. And we beheld his glory. 
the glorious of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. We behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And then you behold his life, full of grace. And the only result of that beholding and beholding one and two is that you bow down before him, the Lord of glory. Now in point one, in John 1, 29, verse, uh, John chapter 1, verse 29. Here John saw those people within, and Jesus was coming. And he made a statement that dated back to ages before that, place, that, that, that time. In John 1, 29, the next day John said Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God. Oh, what a statement. The Lamb of God. That means the Lamb of God's own choosing. All other lambs before this time were chosen by men. This is the Lamb that God has chosen. If you check up in the Old Testament, there were lambs and lambs and lambs and lambs. At the time of Abraham, there was lamb. It was a lamb. At the time of Moses, there was lamb. It was a lamb. But now, here is the ultimate lamb. The lamb of all lambs. The lamb of God. In Genesis 22, Genesis 22, and in verse 7, you find here, Abraham taking his son, and they were going for the sacrifice that the Lord had commanded. And his son asked a question, and I want you to please follow through. In verse 7, Genesis 22. Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father and said, My father? And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Where is the lamb? That boy was asking for what was to come hundreds of years later. The lamb. The father knew better than him. So the father answered in verse 8. Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. Not yet time for the lamb. It's just a lamb, one of many, many other lambs. But the, the lamb you are asking for will not come. I cannot see him. I can't see him. But that boy said, My father, we are going for sacrifice. Where is the lamb? Asking for the lamb of God. The one that John. And since that time, the question that had been on the lips of everyone in Israel. From that time of Genesis through to the coming of Christ has been a question. Where is the lamb? But Abraham said, we can't talk about the lamb now. We can only talk about the shadow, the type of the lamb. He lamb. And then they made a sacrifice and that was it. And that child was replaced by that lamb. That lamb died the death. That child should have died. That lamb was a figure, a type of Christ, and his substitutionary death for us. That you and me, who are children of hell, that should have gone to eternal perdition, that somebody comes and he takes our place, so that the death we should have died because of our sin, the death we should have died because of our uh, wickedness, because of our lying, and because of our self-will, the death we should have died because of our unclean life and immoral life and fornication and lust and drinking and smoking and evil speaking and all the things that we should have suffered for. He now came, the lamb, and he took our place. That child didn't understand that this lamb that died in my place, because that, that child should have died, he was tied by the father, and the fire was ready, and the knife was at the ready, and then God said, stop, don't kill him. There is a lamb that will take his place. And that's the condition of every man and every woman all over the world who are doomed for hell. And if you are here today, and the lamb of God has not washed you, you are doomed for hell. No matter the church you attend, no matter the name you bear, no matter the things you do in the, in the church or in the world, if you have not been washed with the blood of Jesus, if you have not been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, if your sin has not been forgiven, if you are still living in sin, no matter the sin, whether weak sin, 
whether big sin, whether, uh, you know, what you call weakness, what you call besetting sin, or whatever sin, whatever it is that is unclean, that must not see the glorious eyes of the Almighty God, that God must not behold in your life. Whatever it is that your conscience condemns you of, that this is not good. Whatever it is that the Word of God condemns that this is not good, that is the sin. And as long as you are not washed from there, the Lamb of God has not cleansed you. It was a lamb in Genesis. And it was a lamb in Exodus. In Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. You follow me now to verse 1. Uh, you see, uh, this was at the time of the Passover. And they were going to uh, leave Egypt that night. And then in verse 1, the Lord spoke unto Moses and to Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you. I'm at verse 2 now. Exodus chapter 12. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year unto you. Speak ye unto the con all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man, what? A lamb. This is not the lamb here. This is just a shadow of it. This is just a picture of it. If you like, this is a prototype of him. Although that's not even a good word. That's not, it's not even prototype now. It's not even up to It's just a shadow, a picture of the real lamb. A lamb, according to uh, the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto him, uh, his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall take your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish clean, a male of the first year, he shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. So you find that God told them, take a lamb, a lamb that will replace you, that when you kill that lamb, you take the blood of that lamb, you strike it upon the lintel and the doorpost of your house, and then you stay inside, so that when the angel of destruction is passing through the land, so that you will not be destroyed with the destruction that will come upon Egypt and the entire inhabitants thereof. Stay indoors and stay under the protection of that blood. Because when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And that blood and that lamb was talking, typifying, pointing forward to the real lamb. It's not until we go to chapter 12, uh, chapter 1 now of John, that for the first time, first time in the history of humanity, it could be said, here is the lamb. And Christ is that Lamb of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 7. You know, when we come to church, uh, we come with Bible and then we open and we follow on. Uh, we want you to see. That's why when I see I'm fast, I slow down. So that you open your passage and we look at the word it says and then you apply that into your life. So that you don't go home and say, that was a fine, fantastic message. No, it's not a fantastic message. It's the, what is the touch of God in your personal life? In verse 7 here it says, 1 Corinthians 5, to uh, purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. That means the lamb that was killed in Exodus was actually pointing to the lamb. So, when John, uh, when John said in verse in chapter 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God. What did he mean? One, behold the Lamb of God's own choosing. God chosen. Two, behold the Lamb of God's own wounding. God wounded him himself. Because in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 5 to 10, we're told that he was uh, bruised for transgressions. He was wounded for iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we were healed. Then he spoke and spoke. Then he said, I think in verse 9, Yet it pleased God to wound him. It pleased God to wound that lamb. Other lambs were wounded by men. This one was wounded by God himself. Why did God do that? Why did God wound him? Why did God allow him to die? Uh, why did he allow him to die? In Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah chapter 53, he tells us so, in verse, uh, verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted and he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, lamb to the slaughter, lamb to the slaughter, lamb to the slaughter, a lamb to the slaughter. 
and as a sheep before a shearer is done, so he opened not his mouth. And then in verse 9, sorry, in verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. Why did he do that? Oh, the answer is simple, my brothers and sisters. Uh, the reason why he did that is in First Peter. God bruised him. God wounded him. Why? First Peter chapter 1 and in verse 18. First Peter chapter 1 verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your father, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You see that? That the reason why God wounded Jesus, the reason why God wounded his son, that he cried, he said, my father, my father, my God, my God, sorry, my God, my God. If you check all the other places, he will say, my father and I were one. Never did he call him uh, my God like that. He just said, I am my father. If you open the door, I am my father will come and dwell with him. And my father walketh and I walk. And the things that I do, I do not of myself, but of my father that sent me. But when he got on the cross, and the sin of humanity, your sin, my sin, was laid on him. And the heaviness of the load was much. And the sun refused to shine. And God turned away his eyes from him. And there was loneliness there on the cross. And he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And there was no answer from heaven. Never did he call. And God will call, close his mouth and will not answer him. But because of your wickedness, how can you continue in sin? How can you continue telling lies? And you are saying, well, eh, I know I'm trying my best. I used to do seven bad things before. Now I'm only doing three. Eh, I'm not smoking again, but eh, this uh, occasional fornication is still what I do. Eh, I don't know. I don't want to do it, but I'm trying my best. Something that God turned his ways away from Christ. And you are saying, I don't know whether what I need is deliverance or whether what I need is sanctification. Because you know, though I know I'm born again, but I'm still doing masturbation and all that. But eh, I don't know whether I need is deliverance or I need sanctification. Sanctification? So you need to be washed by the blood, the Lamb of God. And to cleanse all that masturbation from your life. Cleanse all that fiddling with your body from your life. Cleanse all that pornography from your life. Cleanse all that dirty thing from your life. So that you'll be washed. He died for you. And God turned his face away from him. So that you'll be redeemed with the precious blood of the Lamb. And you see, I know I'm born again, but I don't know. And uh, sometimes when I just think in my heart that somebody should, evil should happen to somebody, and it just happen like that, that's why my mouth, I don't know, my mouth is very strong. Whatever I say comes to pass, and it's always bad, bad things, negative, negative things. What is that? That's it, witchcraft. And so, you say, I'm born again. No, the blood of Jesus washes clean. If the, the blood of Jesus has washed you, witchcraft will not be there. And, and lying will not be there. You say, well, I know I'm a Christian, but you see, is that when we get to the exam time, the temptations are so much, I don't know, I can't resist, and so I cheat. And I don't like to do it, but I'm born again. And then you cheat in the exam. You know, maybe somebody teaches you something, or you teach somebody something, and then you say, I'll repent thereafter, my friend. Something that the Lamb of God suffered. God turned away his eyes from his own child, and abandoned him. God turned away from him. Listen. Even when angel, Michael, in Daniel, go and read your Bible. When Michael was fighting against the devil, God sent another angel. Sorry, when Gabriel was fighting against the devil, God sent another angel to go and assist him. But when it was on the cross, his own son, no help. Because of your sin. And here you are. You are still fiddling and toying and playing with sin. And you are saying, well, on Monday I'm born again. By the following month you are a sinner. Each time you go for holiday, you fall into all your sin and you do all the evil things. Your girlfriend is back at home. And then you are born again. You say, I'm child of God. I'm a fiery Christian on campus. But when you get back home, the girlfriend is waiting. And you fall into the bosom of that sinful girl. And then you come back to campus and say, I'm going to repent when I come to campus. Suppose the trumpet sounds during holiday. You get to heaven that way. The Lamb of God. That take us away the sins of the world. He, he died for our sins. Look at First Peter chapter three, and in verse eighteen, for Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Think about that. 
He was a child of God. We were children of hell. But he suffered for our sin. He took our punishment so that we can take his enjoyment. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So you see, he was the Lamb of God's own choosing. Have you been then to Jesus for the cleansing power? Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Like some green and some sun. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Say so you should lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And there's a fountain that is flowing for sin and for uncleanness. For the soul unclean. Don't go about reveling in sin and saying it's my weakness, it's my besetting sin. Your besetting sin can take you to hell. Why are you rejoicing in besetting sin? What you call besetting sin? Why don't you bring that besetting sin to the, to the Lamb of God and say, Wash me, O Lamb of God. Wash me from sin. By the night, turn in blood. Make me clean. Fill me with, with, with power within. And make me, let me your image gain. Let me, give me your image. That's what you pray. You say, Lord, I come to you without one plea. That the blood was shed for me. And that you have asked me to come to you. Lamb of God. Wash me. Wash me. Listen to this. In Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 22. This is God speaking. For though... I'll wait for you. Very important passage. Jeremiah 2, 22. For though thou wash thee with nitre, cleansing agent, and you take thee much soap, Yet thine iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord God. Although you try to wash you with soap and nitre, how do you not wash your sin? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You think that uh, you go and commit sin and then you look for something and tip uh, your sin off? You think that washes it off in the record of heaven? No. Yo, the Bible talks about the woman that uh, eats the bread of sin and wipes her mouth and said, I've done no wickedness. You think when you wipe your mouth, you think that cleanses you? A man was, uh, you know, going to another woman's, uh, uh, another person's wife. And the lipstick of that uh, person got on her coat, on his coat. And when he saw the lipstick on his, he says, ah, if my wife sees this, what am I going to do? Remove the uh, coat. And from that uh, simple rendezvous, uh, goes to the dry cleaner and drops the uh, coat there and says, please dry clean this coat for me. How about the trouser? Don't worry about that. Just clean the coat only. And then the, the wife says, ah, what happened to your coat? I just gave it to the dry cleaner. And the dry cleaner cleans the coat and all the lipstick is off. <laughs> but that doesn't wash it before God. And so you find that it says you wash you with nitre. And Jesus made a statement in John. John chapter, chapter 13. John chapter 13. He was uh, with his disciples. And then he was washing them. He was washing them. Verse 4, he rested from supper. And he put aside his towel and he was washing them. When he got to Peter, Peter said, Lord, you want to wash me? He said, yes. I said, you won't wash me, oh. I want to allow you to wash me. And Jesus spoke to him in verse, uh, verse uh, 8. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, you have no part with me. Listen. Christ is in heaven. If he doesn't wash you here on earth, you have no part with him over there. And if you are washed before, but you are falling back into your vomit. You are falling back into the mud, the morass of sin. And you are not washed again. And you are just going about with bold faith. I was washed. I was washed. The washing of antiquity that has gone into, into oblivion. That's of no consequence before God. And you don't come back again to be washed anew and cleansed. And then you say, I was washed. I was washed. If I wash thee not, you have no part with me. You see why you should pray that prayer and I wash me, O Lamb of God? You see why you should not come to him? If there's sin in your life, if there's uncleanness in your life, yes, you have been trying, you fast. Yes, you have been trying, you pray. Yes, you have been trying, you go to church. You go from deeper life to that other church, from that other church to that other church. You are looking for the way. But the more you are looking up and down, you are still in sin. And your conscience tells you you are not clean. Even though we call you bro, maybe we even call you sister. But something tells you in your heart that, look, you are only pretending. You are not really born again. Why don't you then come to him? Lamb of God, 
so that he washes you. That's why John called those people. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the whole world, no matter what your sin may be. No matter. Even if you have killed before, even if you have committed abortion, even if you have stolen, even if you have forced certificate, even if you have done anything, he can for- forgive you if you bring your sin to Jesus. If you repent of that sin, the forgery of the certificate is not as great as the sin, it's not as great as the sin of, of, uh, of Simon the Sorcerer. Uh, it's not even as great as the sin of Paul the Apostle when he was Saul. And yet God forgave Saul, uh, the, the, that man. And God can forgive you. He can change your life. Yes, you say, I came to the university. If I tell them that I spoke for certificate, my life is finished. Don't worry about that. Give your sin to Jesus. Repent first of all and say, Lord, I am a sinner. I know that I am not a child of God. But I come to you. Wash me just as I am. And he cleanses you. And the Lamb of God walks in your life. When that happens... A miracle has happened in your life. And after he has washed you now as the Lamb of God, and you are now part of him, and you are belonging to him, now you can behold once again his life of grace. And that's point number two. Behold his life full of grace. Now, there's a wonderful thing here, brothers and sisters. When we are washed by the Lamb, we are washed by the Lamb in order to become lambs too. We also become lambs. In Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, and in verse, uh, verse 3. And here is the wonderful thing that the lamb does not wash us and leave us as goats. There is a washing of regeneration. There is a washing of transformation that changes our nature from being goats to now being lambs. Look at Luke chapter 10, verse uh, 3. Go your ways. As Jesus speaking to his disciples. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as what? Lambs. Among wolves, he says. You have been with me. And my life has rubbed off on you. I've transferred all that is in me into you. My nature is now your nature. I am lamb. Now you are lambs too. You are now like me. A miracle has taken place in your life. When you see a believer that is not a lamb, so you wonder, did you meet Jesus or counterfeit Jesus? Why is it that your nature is so much unlike that of the Lamb of God? Why are you not a lamb? And what is the nature of the lamb? Just wait, I'll give you shortly now. But you see, he says you are lambs too, because I have met with you, and you are like me now. He said unto him, Ye Lord, thou knowest that I love thee, he said unto him, Feed my what? Lambs. That's not talking about animals. That's talking about human beings. Feed my lambs. How do we know he's talking about human beings? Peter understood. In 1 Peter 5 later, don't open it. He just told them, he said, The elders which are among you are exalted. Who am also an elder. And you partake of the glory that is coming. He said, Feed the flock of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Take it oversight thereof, not by constraint, not by fielding locker. But by the will of God. And it says, When the chief shepherd shall appear, ye also shall appear with him and shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Because Peter understood that when Jesus told him, Feed my lambs. Christ was calling those people that were born again, those people that were saved, those young converts, those people that have put away their sin. They are no longer goats. They are no longer serpents. They are not a generation of vipers. They are now lambs of God. They are like Christ. Christ, Christians. Christians, Christ. They are like Christ. And he says they are lambs. As I'm a lamb, they are lambs too. The question is, you have beheld the Lamb of God? You say, yes, I've beheld him. And I've uh, met him. He has washed me. Let me ask you. He washed you outside. Has he washed you inside? Has he made you a lamb inside? Has he made you like himself? What do we see about the lamb? I don't have time because, you know, I don't, like to, I don't want to keep you too long. But one, think about the innocence of the lamb. You see what the Bible tells us, uh, the passage I read the other time, it said, the lamb shall be without blemish. Blameless and unblemished lamb. Innocence of the lamb. The purity of the lamb. You see what he said in First Peter 1.18. That we read, he said, your lamb. He said, you are not redeemed with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. Innocence of the lamb. 
the purity of the Lamb for such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, and then undefiled and separate from sinners. Harmlessness of the Lamb, the innocence of the Lamb. When you really have met the Lamb of God and He has washed you, you young people, children over there, pay attention. If He has washed you and you are real Lamb of God, listen, you will be innocent. He will not be the one that they will be talking about. He say, hey, he's going to deeper life. But you know, in the school, and you know all the things that you do there? No, you will be a real lamb. It changes your nature. All the hyena nature, all the lion nature, all the, the, the ferocious nature, he has taken everything away from you. All the rebellion at home, he's taking everything away from you. All the disobedience to the pains, he has taken everything away from you. All the, the foolishness or superfluity of naughtiness that all these young people do in the schools, all that is gone from you. And all those uh, writing love letters and all those things to one another, that will not be in your life. You are a lamb. And as a lamb, you have the innocence of a lamb, the purity of the lamb, the cleanliness of a lamb, the holiness of a lamb, the nature of a lamb. I saw something that challenged me. And that's in, uh, uh, in Revelations. In Revelations chapter, chapter 5. Oh, it was quite a challenge. Listen. Revelations chapter 5. There was an announcement in heaven. And they said, a book was available. Oh, we open that book now. And there was nobody to open it. On earth and in heaven. And there was weeping. And there was silence in heaven. And John began to weep. He said, I wept much. I wept much. Because there was no man that could open that book. You remember John chapter 1? Behold the lamb. Now he says, Behold the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He has prepared to open the book. And that man stopped weeping immediately. He wiped the tear from his eyes. Let me see that lion. Let me see that lion. The lion that will, that will open the book that nobody can open. Show me the lion. And as he opened his eyes, lo and behold, in verse 6, behold, I beheld. Because he was told to behold, he said, I beheld. And lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood what? Oh, what blessed glory. They said he was a lion. But when John was going to behold, he said, I saw not a lion, I saw a lamb. And that lamb stood. As it had been slain, having seven eyes and having uh, all the other things in verse 7, he came and took the book and he opened it. Why did they call him a lion? And when John was going to see him, he didn't see a lion, he saw a lamb. Listen, in character, he's a lamb. Gentle, humble, meek, obedient, obedient to the Father. I come to do thy will, O God obedient to the father a lamb in character but when it comes to doing the will of god he's as ferocious as a lion when it comes to doing the will of god he's as aggressive as a lion the bible talks of him that he set his face as a flea to go to jerusalem the bible tells us in john chapter 2 when he got to the temple and he saw the buying and the selling he saw mess in the house of god lamb yes but he took a whip and he got inside there. And all that buying and selling and all those changing of money. And you get to read it in your Bible. John chapter 2. He got in there. He drove all of them. He took the changers of money. He took their table. He turned everything. Drew the boats out. And drove everybody. A single man. Think about that. That kind of anointing. A single man. Why didn't those people gang up together and slap him and beat him? Why didn't they say, you? Oh yeah, let's fight. Anointing came upon him. And a lion, a lamb, but a lion. That's what we're talking about. When the lamb of God has washed you, and you are a lamb, and then there is the glory of God to defend, there is sin, and then you will not be a girl. And you say, uh, deeper, and then one boy will be coming to you and say, ah, how are you? I'm uh, fine. Uh, what's your name? I'm so and so. I've been seeing you in this our class. And uh, actually, I, I just wanted to, I want to get, I thought I should go, get close so that one doesn't withdraw. He said, that's okay. And then uh, he said, uh, by the way, where's your room number? Oh, you say I'm in Mozambique. Ha, Mozambique. I have a friend in Mozambique. Where is he say? Uh, where's your room number? Ah, my room number is uh, number for something, something. Ha, the room of my friend is far, the very next door to that place. I'll come and see. I, I'm, and I need to see that my friend is safe. I'll come and see you too. All right, but... Uh, 
um, when you are coming, uh, please uh, don't uh, say you are looking for me. But, uh, and then uh, and then he comes. Ah, how are you? Ah, so you came. Okay, I came. And then all that. And then you begin a relationship that will take eternal life from you. And then you go on and go on and go on. Then one day when you are walking together, you hold book and then grab your book. Say, please give me my book. Give me my book. I don't like. Give me my book. Say, I don't. Uh, you, I've been coming to your room in Mozambique all this time. You won't come and see me in my hall at our world. Ah, I can't come home. In our church? Ah, okay. Your book, you collect it in our world for me. And then, uh, and then I see you. You're not a lamb. You're not a lion. How ah, you say, as a Christian, you know. A Christian? And you're pulling your scarf. A Christian? And then they, they mistakenly, well, he says it was a mistake. Then put hand on your lap. Ah, you say uh, something. Oh, you say, I'm sorry. It was a mistake. You are gone. Lion. Ferocious. Although a lamb. And so you find the innocence of the lamb. You find the purity of the lamb. You find the, 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 the real life, the meekness of the lamb, the yieldedness of the lamb. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 10, I think, that, you know, you were going to kill him, that's Acts chapter 8, verse 32, that he was going to be killed. As a lamb, he was dumb, yielded, yielded. He was submitted, not fighting, quiet, yielded unto God. And when they were going to kill him, no noise, no struggling. Lamb of God, yielded unto God. How many of us here? If the leader, maybe your leader here comes and says, you there, you there, you there, you are going this way. Are you yielded? Aren't you educated and exalted to the point that who you see by the way to tell me, doesn't you realize that I am so and so? Are you a lamb? That you are in control of your own life. And when the leader comes in that the anointing of the Holy Ghost and preaches against something wrong in your life and says, this is not right. And instead of your bowing before the word of God, you say, if this is the way they will be talking, this is their church. Maybe I won't come again to that their church. Oh, you are not a lamb. A lamb will yield to the word of God. A lamb will submit to the word of God. A lamb will surrender to the word of God. There will be obedience in the lamb. Let me summarize that point. One, the meekness of the lamb. Isaiah 53, verse 7. And then Revelations 5, 1 to 5. Two, the innocence of the Lamb, the purity of the Lamb. Exodus 12 and verse 5. First Peter 1, 18. The purity of the Lamb, innocence of the Lamb. Are you innocent? And many of us here that are not innocent. You need to go back to the Lamb of God to wash you again. Number three, to find the yieldedness of the Lamb, the surrender of the Lamb, the submission of the Lamb. You find all that. Isaiah chapter Acts 8, 32. Acts 8, 32. The Lamb submitted and submissive. Why do we have problems in many fellowships today? In our fellowship today, is a lack of submission. Lack of submission. The leader comes and he says, this is what we should do, this is what we should do. And he's not saying what is outside the word of God. He's saying what is right, what is correct. But because we look at him, how old is he? Okay, it's about, as I look at him, uh, do you know there are people who do that assignment every time? Somebody gets in the pulpit, they will look at him as he's walking that way or this way. They say, mm, okay, if I look at him. Mm, well, maybe it'll be about 24. Uh, 24. I was 24, 1995. And so when, he, when that man stands there and he begins to say the word of God, they look at him and say, ah, this little child, what are you talking and sit down. And not yielded. And if he now go, he goes beyond his boundary. He not only says in the pulpit, no pulpit gives you some covering. And then he gets down there, says all workers wait behind. And then uh, you are doing something, says you there, please, uh, what you are doing is not right. Don't do that. We are in the church of God. Eh? This young boy will not stop it in the pulpit. He can have the audacity so talk to me. Uh -uh. This is their church, self. I don't understand. What don't you understand? You don't understand the word of God? You don't understand that God took Moses. How old was Moses? How old was Miriam? 
When Moses was born, the mother said to that Miriam, said, go and watch over him. When that uh, daughter of Sarah Pharaoh came, Miriam ran out and said, excuse me, trained. Must have been more than five years of age. I said, do I go and call uh, somebody? For he said, yes, go and call me. Do I? Then he went to mommy. Mommy, mommy, come. Our plan has worked. Miriam. And then that Moses got laid hands upon him and said, you are the leader of them all. And Miriam bowed her head. The day she stopped bowing her head, she stood up like this, got turned out to a leper. Huh? He said, how old is he? This and that. It's because we are not sheep. If we are sheep, sheep are easy to lead. Sheep are easy to control. Sheep are easy to direct. Sheep don't rebel against the shepherd. No, it's goats that do that. That uh, scratches the, 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 the ground with the feet. Sheep doesn't do that. The yieldedness of the sheep, of the lamb. And now finally, the worship of the lamb. That's in Revelation chapter 5. And that takes us to the last point. Bow down before the Lord of glory. In Revelation chapter 5, I stopped at verse, um, at verse 8. Where the lamb took the, uh, stood among them. And uh, in verse uh, 8 now, Revelation chapter 5. And when he had taken the book, and the four beasts, listen to this, these are heavenly beings. That's not uh, the, the bad animal. Four beasts and four and twenty elders, what did they do? They fell down. Before where? The lamb. They worshipped him. They worshipped the lamb. All of them, in verse 9, they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and you have taken, redeemed us by God, to God, by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. They began to worship that lamb. Worshipping the lamb of God, because he is Lord of all. In Acts chapter 2, Lord of all, in Acts chapter 2, and in verse 36, Acts 2, 36. And therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. That's Peter preaching. And the message of the Lordship of Christ was the central thing in the message of the apostles all through the Acts of the Apostles. Anytime they preach, they always establish the Lordship of Christ because they understood the Lordship of Christ. Why do we have so many shallow messages in many churches today? The reason why there are so many shallow messages today is because those messages are being preached by people who have not established very well in their personal life the Lordship of Christ. Because the Christ himself, they have not established in their own personal life the lordship and the governorship and the controllership of Jesus Christ in their lives. Because of that, you can't give what you don't have. But these people, the centrality of their message from Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 28 is the, the fact of the lordship of Christ. Look at chapter 10, Acts, and in verse 36. Acts 10, 36. See, 2, 36, 10, 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. And then in bracket, what did he say? You know, when I read this, it reminds me of what these uh, people in the other religion do. When they call the name of their whatever, whatever, uh, the moment maybe somebody is talking, and he says, a prophet so and so, then they will say something. You know what I mean. They will say something, I, I don't know what they are saying. But exactly that's what Peter did here. As he was talking, he said, he started his message. He said the word which, uh, was it Peter or, 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 yes, I think it was Peter. He said uh, the message which was preached by Jesus. And then as he mentioned the name of Jesus, he, he said, under, under another breath, he said, he is Lord of all. Then he continued his message. He reminded himself that the reason I can preach today is because Christ is Lord, even over my own self. How many unqualified people are carrying Bible? Head knowledge. No Genesis, no Revelation, no all those put strings of Bible passages together. Has the Lordship of Christ been established in your personal life? As the, you see Lord over your life? What do we mean when you say Christ is Lord? Now, after we are washed, we come under His Lordship. And as Lord, He is ruler. As Lord, He is governor. That's the meaning. As Lord, He is controller. As Lord, he is 
pilot of your life and destiny. Listen to that. That's the meaning of Lord. Lord, if you check all the synonyms, that's what it means. He is ruler. He is the one that rules over your life. You know, I was uh, meditating on that word the other time. We call the head of this church general superintendent. Then I was saying, I was thinking in my heart, Christ is the general superintendent of the whole universe. And I said that word superintendent. And what does it mean? Superintendent. That means if we all have some intentions, some intentions in our mind, and this superintendent, super intention comes and he brings his own intention, his intention will swallow our own intention. What he intends will take over our own intention. If we had some plans before, and then the superintendent, Almighty God, he comes and says, This is my intention. Super intention. Superintendent. That's Jesus Christ. And that's the meaning of Lord. That's the meaning of Lord, ruler, governor, governor. And that's the, that's the, the controller, pilot of your life and your destiny. Is he like that in your life? How many decisions you take in your life that you never consult him? How many actions you put up in your life that he never has a say about it? How many choices you have made in your life that you never even consulted him? And you had to say in your mouth, he is Lord. Is he? Really? And uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And in verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 22 and it says who is gone that's talking about jesus christ who is gone into the heaven and is on the right hand of god angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him see that they are subject unto him if he is lord does he have control over you then listen does he hold the reign of your life reign r-e-i-n you know when you are riding a horse, you have the rein, you hold the rein in your hand. That's the, 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 the rope. And so when you want the horse to stop, you pull that thing and this horse will stop. Does he have the rein of your life? Is he in control? Uh, or are you, is he the one that calls the shots in your life? Is he in the saddle? That's the meaning of being Lord. He's in the saddle of your life. He writes you about. How many of us have forgotten the fact of the Lordship of Christ in our lives? How wonderful the whole church will be if all the people in the church, young and old, if we all lived our lives on a daily basis under this constant lordship of Jesus Christ. And you don't take a step without saying, Lord, is this okay? Not wear anything without seeking approval and say, Lord, this dress I want to wear, my Lord. What do you say about it? This thing I want to put on my body. Lord, is it okay? Do you approve of it? No, we don't go to the Lord. We go to the fashion houses. And we go to all those fashion, so-called fashion designers. And we go to all those people. And we go to all those other people in the hostels. Those are the people that determine, our, that determine our fashion. Not the Lord. Certainly not the Lord. Because if it was the Lord that determines what you wear, you will not conform to the world. You conform to His will. If you are going to take a decision, what to do, where to go, and what not to do, and it is your law. You would never take a decision without asking him, Lord, I want to do this thing. What will you have me do? You will never make a choice and just see a girl at, uh, or see a boy at, uh, at uh, Mama Put's shop. And then you say, ah, and then you start something, and then before we know it, you are printing wedding cards. Did you tell the Lord about it? Did you consult the Lord? No, he pleased me well. That's all. If he is Lord, you will never take a decision. Look at your service, your ministry, the work you are doing for God. If he is Lord, you will not be doing the work as if it's your own. You know you are going to give account to him. How many workers today are doing the work of God as if they are the Lord, they are the owner? So if they do it, they do it. If they don't do it, they don't do it. And if they don't like to do it, they don't like to do it. Finish. And he, they, you can't hold them down to it and say, this is the way the Lord wants you to do it. It's because they don't understand the Lordship of Christ. Oh, that we may, we may understand it. He is Lord. Lord. And there are four people in this regard. And there are four are here. One, those in whom Christ is precluded, prohibited. 
don't have time to you just put it there. Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. The Bible talks about Christ, that some people are without Christ. They are without Christ. Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. That means they are Christless. Christ is pro- prohibited from their lives. That's the one you have not heard. The other three you have heard. I'm borrowing it from our pastor. Number two, those in whom Christ is present. John 3.30. He must increase, I must decrease. Christ is a little in their life. Maybe 50 of Christ and 50 of the other things. Some people are not writing anything. You are sitting down. Uh, I hope you have your Bible here. Sit right and pay attention to the Word of God. He is present. Present. He is not He's just, he's not the Lord, but he's there. 50-50. Number three, those in whom Christ is prominent. There are other forces too. There are other interests. There are other lords. You know, that man was crying, I think in Lamentation. He said, O Lord of Israel, other lords besides thee have had dominion over us. Oh, that you find believers that there are other lords that have dominion over them, apart from Christ. That man was weeping and lamenting. Christ is prominent, but he's not the only one that is prominent. There are other things. There are other forces. Some is their job prominent. Some others is their father prominent. Some is the desire to ambition prominent. Some is the family prominent. Some is the certificate prominent. But Christ is also there. He is precluded or prohibited. He is not even there at all. He is present. Maybe 20% of Christ. 80% of self. And then he is prominent. Well, he is there. At least you can see him. But there are other things also there. And four. Those in whom Christ is preeminent. Preeminent. All in all. Look at Matthew chapter 18. And this my prayer. May it be your prayer too. Matthew 18. Where you said amen by faith. Because you didn't know what the prayer is. Let me show you the prayer now. Matthew 18, verse 7. Matthew 18, 7. Sorry? Matthew 17, not 18. Matthew 17, 17, 8. Not 18, 7. 17, 8, please. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man. Save, except Jesus only. And here is the prayer now. That God... I pray that when people lift up their eyes and they see my life, that they will see none except Jesus only. Not just in my message. Jesus only is a message. Fine. What of our lives? You see our life too? Jesus only? That they look at your life and Jesus is so preeminent. Preeminent. And if your fellowship or relationship with, with Jesus will bring you in collision with your wife, so be it. If it will bring you in collision with a father, so be it. If it will bring you into collision with a lecturer, let it be so. If it will bring you into collision to a beloved one, so be it. I read something in my quiet time this morning. Why I cried. Ezekiel, God told him, he said, I gave you a ministry. And as part of your ministry, in the morning I'm telling you, your wife is going to die today. And you must not weep. You must not cry. You must not shed tears. You must not, you turban your head, dress normally, do everything properly. No money, nothing. God told him that in the morning. And in the evening, his wife died. The Bible says, God told him, he said, I take away the desire of your eyes from you. Don't we? Oh, I said, what? Even God can get to that point that he will say, the desire of your heart. That's the name of, he called his wife. That's Ezekiel 24. He said, I'm going to take her away from you. And he took that woman away from that man. And the following morning, the man got up and dressed properly and did everything. And he was going about the street and the people said, Ah, what's this? What's the matter? You are not going to weep and mourn? He said, God told me that for your sake, he wants to use me to teach you a lesson. That I must not weep, I must not cry. Oh, that Christ will be preeminent. That will, if your love and fellowship with Christ will bring you into collision with anything with your tailor. So be it. With your friend, so be it. With your status, so be it. When that happens in your life, is Lord there. And Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? If he is Lord, where is the obedience you are giving him? 
Is he Lord in your life? I see, I see any, any say in your actions. Is he Lord? Really? If he be Lord, where is the obedience he deserves? And where is the respect he demands from you? Where is the service he demands from you? Where is the worship he demands from you? If he is Lord. Those people said, we will not have this man to reign over us. They didn't want Christ. They threw away the reigning of Christ. And there are people here. Yes. Those people, Jesus was telling a parable. He said there is a parable. He said a man went to a far country. Before he came back, his citizens sent after him. Luke 19 now, verse 13. He said, they told him, he said, we will not have this man to reign over us. They threw away the lordship of Christ. Have you thrown away the lordship of Christ in your life? You say no. I say yes. Yes, if the word of God is no longer paramount in your life, you have thrown away the lordship of Christ. Yes, if the fear of God is no longer before your face, you have thrown away the lordship of Christ. If your obedience to Christ is not prompt and total, if your obedience is affected and influenced and moderated by your friend, by your husband, by your wife, by your child, by your superior, by your ambition, by whatever you think you want in this world, and that brings your obedience to Christ, tempers it down, you have thrown away the lordship of Christ. You have to go back to that lordship. He wants all of you or none of you. Some of you are struggling. You are struggling hard. You don't want Christ to You want to have Christ, but at the same time, you want to have other things. No, no, ma. No, sir. He wants all of you. All of Christ and none of self. All of Christ and none of self. Lord, at last thy love has conquered. None of self, but all of you. Has he conquered in your life? Is he your Lord? What beautiful Christians shall we have? If Christ truly is given his lordship condition and position. Today, I challenge you, as I do challenge myself, that we will get to a point when Christ will not only be prohibited, he will not be prohibited at all, not only present, not only prominent, but he is preeminent. He is Lord of all. All areas of your life. And there's no area of your life you are put, don't go in. No thoroughfare. For Christ. He say, touch this place, but this one, reserved. Don't go there. But you throw the door of your life, every part of it, open to him. And he can do anything he wants in your life. Then you are truly a disciple. Today I call you to the Lord. I call you to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And if he has not washed you, Lamb of God, he wants to wash you today. And if he has not transformed your character and your nature, I've not finished. Don't start praying. Don't use that to stop me. If he has not changed your character, if he has not changed your life, if he has not changed your nature, allow him to do it. I'm honest like this because the end of the world is near. I read things. I follow events. <laughs> you see what's happened to his, this man is talking as if he's charged. He's under, under oppression. Under a possession. Yes. The Lord is coming. We are to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I don't want you to be a people prepared for deeper life. A people prepared for our church. We gather you people here. You bring your money. See your leader. He was talking about money for retreat. Eh, let's pay for retreat. Let's say, and you will bring money. And you bring all your money. And we collect all that money, we buy food, we do all that, and then they put the money, they buy fuel into our car, we go all about, and then they say they pay house rent, they pay this, they pay that, and then we gather you people here, and you don't get to heaven. What's the use? That's why. If the Lordship of Christ has not been established in your life, including those of you newcomers, begin today. Begin today, because who knows? We don't know when Christ will come. It may be at morn. It may be at dawn. It may be at the time you don't expect. And that man said, even so, come Lord Jesus. If he comes, we will be ready. Okay, now let's rest up and pray. Check up, you see your lamb. As he washed you from sin, cleanse you. Cleanse you. 
wash you whiter than snow. You are pure, you are righteous, you are holy. As He washed you by the blood of the Lamb, as He cleansed you, as He made you pure, as He made you holy, as He walked in your life by His grace divine. <laughs> oh, that you may be a Lamb. Lamb of God, just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou hast bid me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. O oh, Lamb of God, I come. But God, wash me. Wash me from sin. If you are not washed, you can have part with him. If I wash thee not, you have no part with me, says the Lord. You have a part with Christ on the final day. If he has not washed you now, bring your sin to him, he will wash you. Bring your sin to him, he will cleanse you. Bring your sin to him, he will make you pure and holy. Bring your sin, and he will forgive your sin. He will make you his own. Is he your Lord? If he is not your Lord, what right have you to preach the word? What right have you to preach his word? Is he your Lord? Does he reign supreme in your life? Does he reign completely and totally in your life? Is he in control? Is he the one in the saddle of your life? Is he the one that holds the reign of your life? Is he the governor, the general superintendent of your life? The one that has super intention. That when you have an intention before, he comes with his own intention, you drop your own. His intention swallows your own intention. That's, that's the general superintendent, and that's the almighty God. He is the general superintendent of earthly general superintendents. Have you allowed him to, to, have, to be the superintendent over your life? Is he your superintendent? Or you are the superintendent of your own life? Whatever you will, you do. Whatever you want, you do. No man can stop you. Nobody can reason with you. Whatever path you follow, you follow. Nobody can tell you don't go that way. God cannot tell you don't go that way. Bible cannot tell you don't go that way. Whatever you want, you just go ahead and do. Is he the superintendent over your life? Have you surrendered all? Have you given everything to him completely and say, Lord, all of me, all of me, I just throw at your feet. Or are you in control? Are you in charge? Are you a lamb? A lamb, lamb, innocent, lamb, lamb, yielded, lamb, harmless, lamb of God, lamb of God, lamb of God. Oh, that you might be a lamb. Lamb in your nature. Lamb in your life. You are not a goat. You are not a viper. You are a lamb. Lamb. Lamb of God. Lamb of God. Hey, if you can be a lamb too, this world will be a better place. We will be reflecting Christ everywhere we will be carrying all about. People see him. They see Christ in us. But you better pray because don't say, Lord, well, you should stop the prayer. Pray and pray. Pray and get the, lamp, the, the Lordship of Christ established in your life. And if you are a sinner here, come to the fountain. Come to the Lamb that He might cleanse you. That He might wash you. That your sins might be purged. Washed in His blood. That your sins might be forgiven. Forgiven by His grace. You can come to him today and be washed, washed whiter than snow. You can come today and be cleansed, cleansed and whiter than snow. If I wash thee not, you have no part with me. That's what Jesus says. If he doesn't wash you, he has no part with you. Have you been washed by him? In Jesus' name we pray. I don't like to stop your prayer. I don't like to stop your prayer, but please, I must say, uh, give a chance to all those who are here today and for the first time or maybe for the second time maybe you were washed before but you have gone back into dirt, dirt morass and you are messed up now you want to be cleansed again and you want Jesus to come with that weep and weep all that buy and sell in your life drive them out or maybe for the first time in your life you want to put away your sin this uh, sound system is not very powerful. Please uh, allow them to hear what I'm saying. Amen. I'll give you a chance to pray.